All right, I'll uh, get everyone started. This is not loud enough to tell. All right, I think we'll get started if everyone's ready. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is Duke Law and Technology Society's first and kickoff event, so we're excited to have such a great turnout. Um, this panel will be on virtual reality and the law, and today the panel will be moderated by Professor Jeff Ward. For those of you who don't know, he's the director of the Center on Law and Technology and is super uh, important here in terms of uh, helping Duke brand itself as a law and technology powerhouse in the country. Um, next, we have Helen Bertelli of Infinite Global, where she focuses on helping law firms and other professional services companies, and in one way that she does so is by helping them leverage virtual reality. Um, next, we have Brandon Huffman of Odin Law, where he focuses on AR and VR in law. And then we have Mike McArdle, who's from Lucid Dream, who's the virtual reality company that's providing the technology that we're about to live demo to start this off. Um, so yeah, to give you a little layout, I think first what we're going to do is we're going to bring someone up to demo the technology that we've been demoing this morning. And uh, we'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll have an open panel discussion with questions. And then at the end, for whoever who can, please come down here at the end. Uh, I think our panelists would like to take a picture with all of you so we can kind of show how much interest there is in this space. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Jeff, but thanks again for coming. Yeah, great. This, um, I just want to say thanks to <clears throat> Sean and Roy and Jeremy and Kyle and others who have um, done a great job of consolidating interest in law and technology here. Uh, this is a great first event. How cool to do uh, a, a virtual reality event for one of their first, but there are a lot of technologies I know that people in this room care about, and they're lining up some, some really cool stuff throughout the year. So thanks to, to you all. You've done a, a great job bringing this together. So uh, I'm going to step out of the way here. I want to do two things, or promise two things. One, I want we're going to get a demonstration here. That's one promise so that everybody can see what we're talking about. The other is that I want to make sure we save time at the end because I think this is a place where people might have some questions that they'd like to ask of this panel around the business use cases of um, virtual reality and uh, augmented reality and also about some of the legal issues uh, that, that are uh, implicated by this. So um, is our tech ready to go? It will be once yeah. I find a working outlet. It will, it will be uh, in a second. All we need is an outlet. You know, everything else is, is ready to go. Do you want to do a quick show of hands, see if anyone's experienced? Yes, that would be great. How many people have ever witnessed, experienced, or used uh, a VR tool? Okay. Good. We have a Good sa savvy crew. No, none of you have. Savvy crew. Um, has anybody had experience at a law firm that uses VR tools? Ah. <laughs> Helen, that's your market opportunity that's right there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So that's that's very good. A um, couple of announcements while we're while we're waiting. So um, if you are not yet involved in the Law and Technology Society, and this is one of your first events, I just encourage you to reach out. Um, Sean will offer your uh, name as the person to contact. Sean is compiling a list of folks who want to be aware of events like this. Uh, a lot of them happen at the law school. A lot of them happen around the triangle and other places. And in fact, the law school hosts a lot of its events, not here at the law school, but rather places like the bullpen in downtown Durham. So you might not know just by walking by. So having a little bit of a heads up from that listserv can be a really good thing. That's one. The other is that there are um, a host of courses that uh, are happening at the law school and elsewhere that might interest you. Um, uh, Obviously, courses are ongoing right now, but there are some law tech-related courses happening in winter session. Uh, in the spring, I'll be teaching the artificial intelligence and robotics class. Again, that's one in case people are interested. But there are also some others that people just might not know because they're not happening at the law school. There's a crypto ventures class that happens at Fuqua. Um, I know that um, Cam Harvey, Professor Cam Harvey, who teaches that class, is really, really eager to have law students involved in that class. So if you're looking for a fun, an amazing course uh, for the spring that gets you out of the law school and has a um, business, law, entrepreneurship, and blockchain-based component to it, um, Cam Harvey's Crypto um, Ventures class is a really good one. Um, Professor Waitskin, Buzz Waitskin, uh, uh, Nita Fairhaney, and others oftentimes teach classes that are sometimes cross-listed in the law school, but sometimes through the Masters of Bioethics and Science Policy. That might not come to your mind right away as a, uh, a, a, a name for the kind of class that you want to take at LaTeX, but there are a, a bunch of courses there, including um, Professor Waitskin's Amicus Lab, which writes uh, Amicus briefs on really cutting-edge um, technological issues, and that will be happening in the spring as well. And then Professor Michael Klamen um, from Engineering is also teaching a class in addition to my uh, robotics and AI class. He's teaching an AI class focused primarily on auto um, autonomous vehicles uh, in the spring, and that's going to be taught through, I think, an engineering code 
number. So just wanted to make people aware of that. Are we good? Okay, great. That was perfect amount of time to, to share the love around law tech. All right, um, so we're gonna have about 10 minutes here. This will give us at least a, a somewhat of an understanding of what it's like to experience, uh, have a VR experience in case people haven't had it, and then we'll open things up to our panel. So. All right. um, I was thinking maybe as I get him set up, if you wanna introduce yeah. kind of what the- Yeah, what we're gonna look at. Um, is this, should I talk into this, or can you guys see me? I don't know. Lean in a little All bit. All right, lean in. <laughs> lean in. Lean in. Ironic, right? <laughs> I tell you what, I wrote an article about how there should be more women in the VR space. Um, I went to a VR conference earlier this year, and um, in London, actually, and um, my, uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to write an article for PR Week, and the guy at PR Week was, the editor was like, so you just write about what the most interesting aspects of the conference was. And I, um, the first half of the entire day, the ladies' bathroom was locked. <laughs> and one of the, we all had to queue for a um, handicap um, bathroom. And one of the women in line turned to me and said, I guess they didn't think more girls would show up. And I wrote the article all about that. So it just got me thinking with the Lean In reference. Um, you know, as much as we're talking about this, one of my, one of my goals is to try to get more women involved in this because there's an amazing nexus between, um, in, in my field where there's a lot of, uh, lot of marketing and, and communications professionals are women. Um, what we're talking about here is immersive storytelling, which takes storytelling to the, to the nth degree. It's um, the m more powerful tools than we've ever had before. My company is interested, my company is the largest provider of PR and communication services to the legal industry in the world. Um, and we have offices all around um, the world. And so I wanted to make a bang at, um, at a trade show in March, a legal, a legal trade show. Um, and we developed the first, what we, we didn't, I coined the term walkable website, because in talking to people about VR, it was very hard to convey what exactly we're talking about. It's like talking about what was the internet gonna be like in 1988, you know? When someone has no context for, for experiencing, it's very hard to communicate. So we called it the first walkable website in the legal industry. And we unveiled it in March, and we studied it um, in a survey afterwards. Um, and I'll tell you the results of that when we get into that. But that, this is what you're about to see is, is the piece that we partnered with Lucid Dream to cr create all about our company. And, um, and that's, what, that's what he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna demo here. OK. So what I'd like you to do, look down at your hand, the controller that I handed to you. Um, you see the panel in front of you that says press button to launch. Yeah. What you're going to do is you're going to put your hand into that press it right in and it'll highlight and then you're going to pull the trigger when it's highlighted and we'll be ready to go. If you have any questions, I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Infinite Global Virtual Reality Experience. Infinite Global is an award-winning communications firm focused on PR, branding, content, and virtual and augmented reality for law firms, B2B, and professional services clients around the world. Through this virtual reality experience, we hope to tell our story, as well as convey ideas for how other companies can use this technology for training, marketing, and business development. Use the remote in your hand to interact with the globe. By placing the remote on the globe and pulling the trigger, you can grab and spin the world. Pressing the thumb pad with your hand on a location will call up more information about Infinite Global's history, locations, and services. When you're ready, try pressing the thumb pad on one of our offices and enjoy. So by thumb pad, what she really means is that, yeah. Our London office was founded in 1994 as SPADA, one of the first communications agencies in the world to specialize in legal and professional services PR. 20 years later, in 2014, our US operations, at the time known as Infinite PR, merged with SPADA. And in 2016, our entire company was rebranded to become Infinite Global. Like our other offices, London houses team members from each of our disciplines. PR. Branding. Content. And virtual audience reality. Our London location is close to many of our clients in the capital's traditional legal district placed between the West End and the city. London is also the hub for our exclusive global affiliation network of PR firms, which help us service multinational clients. 
Network members and specialists in their respective markets include PR firms in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Belgium, Israel, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, and Malaysia. was our first North American office, founded in 2001 by Jamie Diaferia. Our Manhattan presence is in the heart of Midtown, just steps from Grand Central Station. The office is home to PR, marketing, and communication specialists, and is also the hub of our content center, a network of award-winning journalists who produce content for our clients. Our New York team members enjoy all the trappings of living and working in Manhattan, from world-class dining to theater and nightlife. We invite our clients and colleagues from around the world to visit us at any time in New York. financial district and a short distance away from Silicon Valley, the bustling center of innovation and home to many of our clients. San Francisco is our largest North American office with dozens of employees, interns, and freelancers at any given time. And the office frequently hosts visits, retreats, and trainings for team members from our other offices. Infinite Global employees come from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines. Many are former journalists, marketing professionals, and lawyers. All are trained and highly skilled in working with clients who are in sophisticated fields, such as law, accounting, real estate, and technology, and all care passionately about client service. We also have fun and enjoy working with one another. Thank you for participating in the Infinite Global Virtual Reality Experience. You may now remove your headset. <laughs> Very nice. I'm just impressed you didn't knock anything over. <laughs> you, did, you did a great job. So. so anybody, before we go to the panel. Anybody who got a chance to do that there or um, in the hour and a half before this session, um, was there anybody who was their first time doing a, a, having a VR experience? Was there anybody in the room who did that for the first time? A any thoughts on, on? It did, it was so real. So I'm going to um, get to you in a second here, Brandon, but I want to go back to Helen first, okay? So we just saw a walkable website. I like that term a lot, a walkable website. But what I want to know is what are the, so that's a great place. You can imagine a law firm or a company who wanted to highlight its global presence and make people have an immersive experience. That's great. But what are the uses of, that law firms in particular might make of VR that we, that are different than that? Other things that you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's a great question, and it's 
one that we are exploring with a lot of um, a lot of our clients. I, I was telling the story how I first got involved in in, in this area. One of our clients is, is Mayor Brown, and they have a very prominent Supreme Court practice, and we work with them. Um, and two years ago, more than two years ago, they approached us to try to get a, a, a piece of marketing together that would take them to the next level. And I just was reading and fascinated in, in, in the art at the time, and I thought, what better way to communicate how awesome a Supreme Court practice is like than, than getting somebody actually to stand in the US Supreme Court, which is something that most of us can only have a dream that we'll ever be able to do. They have a partnership with Yale Law School, and I said, well, let's build this for Yale Law School, let them have, have it there in the Supreme Court clinic. Um, let, let the students um, practice giving oral arguments in the US Supreme Court. As you said, you do feel like you're there. Um, and so that's how I ended up meeting Lucid Dream, and, and we've been ideating several projects. Um, you know, my, I come at things from a business and marketing perspective. Um, I have also investigated the legal and, um, and evidentiary and use in the courtroom aspects as well, because obviously that's my industry. I'm, um, but I'm sure you can get into that in more depth as well. But um, so we've been talking to clients about um, using something like this in, in the waiting room, rather than having brochures that people flip through, right? You know, so many of our clients want to talk about their international presence, how they're international people, you know, international firms, and it. Well, what does that mean? Let, let, let them walk your Hong Kong office. Let them, you know, meet. Actually, feel like they're meeting um, the team in London. Let, just from your office, uh, from your waiting room in New York for five minutes. Um, so marketing applications include that. We have people and practices um, doing um, highly dif you know, difficult um, uh, biosimilar work, for example. And um, they want to, they have highly technical issues they have to communicate in trade shows. And what better way to be able to do this than, than molecules that you can actually move and build. Um, so we're, we're looking at ways to help the lawyers actually communicate with their, um, with their clients and, and show their clients they actually know the, the technology that they're helping to work with. And then there's, finally, I mean, I, I wrote an article for the New York Law Journal a couple months ago, and I sort of, I don't know if that new um, Ready Player One movie that comes out in March. I'm, I'm speculating that it might, be, it might be released in VR. I don't know. Pro maybe not, but... Then you get a patent or trade dispute as a result of that movie, and because it was released in VR, you need to be able to ex explain to a jury what the heck it is that we're talking about. So the only way to do that is using the technology. And so the hand is go your gun hand is going to be forced. You're going to be using this in the courtroom. It's not going to be a matter of whether judges want it or not. You're going to have to use it eventually, because so many other industries, all of our clients' clients, are using this and tinkering with it in different ways. And so our clients need to get to know this technology and, um, inside and out so that they can help their clients. That's great. Uh, you mentioned Mayor Brown is one firm. A lot of firms right now are scrambling to position themselves as tech savvy, right? Um, through foot presses around cybersecurity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> all, all sorts of other issues that are arising. You, I hadn't thought about it before, but it's not just around the content that they offer, but even the waiting room experience, right? What a great way to show that a firm is, uh, and, and that you might be the ones even next year who introduce that to your firm, so that's great. Brandon, I'm gonna ask you a double-sided question. You sure. can choose to answer however you want. Okay. Um, so it can be either, what are, the, what are the ways that you see it working its way, VR working its way into the law, or what are some of the legal issues that would keep you up at night uh, about uh, VR? And I'm gonna get to both those questions either way. Okay. I thought I'd give you a chance to. Sure, so to I'll start with the, the the VR into the law, because I think that's kind of a better transition from what we were just talking about. I think that um, what we just heard may be slightly optimistic that the hand will be forced. I think there are courtrooms in this country that still don't use televisions. So I think we're maybe a bit optimistic on VR coming in quickly. Um, also, I can tell you from having seen video game cases litigated, they don't play the video game in the courtroom. They look at screenshots and they look at you know samples of code and they talk to experts. So the idea that litigating a case about VR would require VR, I think maybe won't actually force anyone's hand the way that we might hope that it will. Um, from the actual admission of VR as evidence, or, or even 360 video, so what we saw in the New York experience there was just 360 video, which is not the same as an immersive VR experience where in the beginning, which was an immersive VR experience where you can interact with things and you can move around the environment and change things. And I think that 360 video has been deployed in some trial courts. 
but they don't put the headset on the jury. Um, they really just scroll around the video from the lawyer's perspective. And what the jury sees is just a TV screen with sort of a, you know, an oblong shaped flat viewing area. Um, so I think that will progress and people will start using that more and more because it's, it doesn't really change the technology the court itself has to have. It's just a video screen. And then the computer comes with the lawyer, right? Um, but having a true VR experience where either the lawyer is able to manipulate the environment or the jury itself is able to manipulate the environment, I think we're kind of a far way off from. Um, and I say that because even now, you look at simulation evidence and the evidentiary fights that go into getting that into the courtroom. So you end up having experts on both sides arguing whether the, arguing whether the, uh, and you guys have taken evidence more recently than me, so, you know, I apologize. But it, they'll be arguing whether the probative value is there, right? Whether it's probative at all, whether the the science is accurate and the the representation of it in the simulation is entirely accurate, and that's step one. Step two is arguing, you know, is this going to have too great an effect on the jury? Is it prejudicial? And that because it's so immersive, I think that's gonna be the harder argument to make in the long run. Um, for those of you that haven't tried VR, jump straight to the Vive. Skip, the, so this is a Vive setup. Skip you know, Samsung's Gear VR that you put on your head and put your phone in. Skip Google Cardboard, jump straight to the Vive so that you can understand how immersive it can be and then backpedal to the other stuff. Because the other stuff is what is more likely to be used but this gives you an idea of the potential future implications. Um, yeah, I think it's great. I just wanted to point out for that the contrast, right? So, Helen, you work with industries beyond the law as well, right? So, right. Or your degree. So the optimism about well, people will adopt technology, right? And, then and you're also have, seeing a marketer sitting next to a lawyer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really good. It's so story of my life. Right? <laughs> But um, what I will say is I, I interviewed, a, um, I had a fascinating interview for the, the article I wrote with um, an, uh, an evidence, a person who creates evidence for, for te um, in technology for courtroom applications in, in the UK. And they had a um, very highly, um, high dollar, large accident that they had, um, had insured, you know, it was going to be two, three million pounds um, worth of potential damages. And the insurance company had him develop a VR piece and I, you know, this was interesting to hear him walk through um, this, the, the, the technology is such that it, as you think about auto, autonomous vehicles, right, um, and the types of technology that you have now, and um, this was a lorry, a, a truck driver, and he, 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 has, he had um, sensors all around his cab, so his company knew exactly what he was doing every moment, and they were able to take that and recreate a VR piece as a result that was very hard for, for the opposing side to say, oh, that's actually not what happened. Because what we're talking about is amalgamation here of, of um, the internet of things, and then ultimately how it is going to be used to communicate stories. And, and so you've got, the, you've got the increased, the more the world increases its technology and the monitoring that's already happening, and uh, the, the VR that can be built on top of that, the harder it is for um, the opposing counsel to say, oh, that's not really true, you know, well, how do you argue that it's not? But that just the sheer threat, the sheer power of the piece that was created ma made the uh, other side just back down and they settled. It didn't even go to court, it didn't even happen. So I, I think about, um, in terms of the legal actual applications, that's less m my experience, but I do think that there's um, a lot of promise for arbitration or a lot of promise for, you know, pre, uh, for even disputes that arise that don't uh, actually get to the court. Yeah, and we were talking earlier about crisis PR. So yeah. Your, yeah. your client is facing something that is going to go to court, and you know maybe they can't get this into evidence, but you know I used the, the Wendy's finger in right. the chili example, right? So <laughs> so that's a classic like PR nightmare. Do that in finger VR. In the I was going to say that. <laughs> well, so, so the VR solution there is show in VR the entire production line that goes into getting chili from, you know, cow to your paper bowl, right? And if you show that in VR, it has such an effect on it. And you're not going to get that into the courtroom, but you can release that as a free experience as part of your PR push before that trial ever comes up. In the court of public opinion. In the court of public yeah. opinion, right? So if you're Wendy, you know, what's a foreign object case really going to cost you, right? It's not going to cost you all that much in paying that woman for finding a finger in her chili, which she didn't, by the way. Um, <laughs> But it's going to cost you, you know, 
mom's not going to stop at the drive through at Wendy's when there's a Rally's or a McDonald's or whatever next door. Mm. And so that's your bigger concern, is convincing people outside the courtroom, hey, it's still safe to come to Wendy's. And you do that by showing it to them. And the more visceral you can make that, the bigger impact it has. And I wonder sometimes, I never went to law school. So I, I, I just wonder aloud at this, because I work with lawyers all the time in litigation, public relations work. That's a big part of what we do. And I think uh, many of the lawyers that I worked work with at the time did not, did not ever think that they would be doing that type of thing. But actually they do, especially if they're in litigation. And, and uh, they spend some of the biggest, most successful litigators we work with spend, I would say, at least half of their time thinking about that. Absolutely. I mean, as a lawyer, you're solving a problem, not right. just litigating the that's case. Right. Absolutely. So I, I just want to note for the record, that's probably not the only time McDonald's will be mentioned at a panel this year, but it is the only time rallies will be noted. As well. so. <laughs> checkers, I think, <laughs> in the South. Rallies and checkers are the same go. thing. That's, yeah. that's good. I'm, I'm glad you're diversifying our, yeah. uh, our fast food re uh, references. Um, Mike, I, I, I want to help us expand our horizons here. And um, we already had the vibe experience, so we're starting to have the more immersive. But I'd love to hear, in, given that what you're developing, et cetera, what, where you see VR being used. And um, maybe kind of some of the immediate cases, but also some of the, holy cow, right? Like, we might use it there as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to answer that question. I appreciate a question like that, because I, too, did not go to law school. I probably know the least about law out of anyone here. However, I do know a lot about VR. Um, and so I'll talk in general sense, and then hopefully you guys will kind of pick up where I leave off in terms of actually. I think experiences. a lot of people here are here because they're excited about technology, so don't feel bad about that. Good, <laughs> that's good. So VR, as Brandon said, the HTC Vive, um, which is what we just demoed, is uh, right now represents the ultimate in, in virtual reality technology from a relatively affordable consumer-facing price point. Um, somewhere in Fort Bragg, there is a headset that blows this thing out of the water and it's $150,000. But that's not necessarily that relevant for our conversation. This thing is $600 and the computer is only 1000 So if you think about it, for under two grand having an experience, it's almost as good as the one in Fort Bragg. Uh, that's, that's incredible. That's something that's only recently happened. Um, it has happened uh, at a rapidly accelerating pace. Um, virtual, virtual reality right now um, is on track to um, to really accelerate and pick up its adoption. A lot of people say that we're at the ninth, or 2007 when the first iPhone was announced for VR. I think it's actually even earlier. I think we're at the, you know, Saved by the Bell, Zach Morris, hello, you know, like pulling out his phone. That's where we are with VR. Um, so as to your question, where it will be eventually, um, I think it's very clear that eventually um, we will have a pair of glasses, maybe even contact lenses. Um, but let's, let's do glasses first. Um, and they will be on the spectrum, I call it the spectrum of, of augmented or virtual reality. Um, virtual reality and augmented reality, right now they're very different technologies, but they are on the same spectrum. And that spectrum is putting data into the real world or putting you into the data. So VR is all about making our interaction with information a lot more human. And it's ironic that uh, it's the bleeding edge of tech that actually makes our interaction with data so much more natural and human. If you think about some of the older generation, like I'm trying to explain to you know, my grandparents how to operate a computer or navigate through the internet, the reason they can't do that is because it's really a whole language that we've built up. It's mouse and keyboard and abstraction layers and folders that aren't really folders and file structures that aren't really there. It's not anything physical. And so what VR will do, I can put a, a headset on my grandmother and she doesn't, you know, I don't need to explain her how to look around, right? Because she's been doing that her whole life. So eventually, VR will be a pair of sunglasses that you tap and you can either replace the world entirely or you can insert uh, virtual things into the real world. And it's going to be wild. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely going to be wild. It's, it's crazy. Can I follow up on that with a, yeah. a, 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 a literature question? So uh, we already had a reference to Ready Player One, mm -hmm. um, which if people haven't read or I guess soon see Ready Player One, it's, a, it's actually, I found it very helpful mm -hmm. to help me get my mind around what a truly immersive experience can be. And then those questions about, it felt so real, it helps me to see how somebody might feel uh, an infliction of emotional distress, right, in a, in a VR space, because I was so immersed in the novel. Are there other science fiction works that you can think of that help us to prepare our, our minds for, uh, 
Well, the, the three big ones, I'd say, are Ready Player One, uh, Snow Crash, and Neuromancer. Um, so it was Neil Stevenson. Neil Stevenson was Snow Crash. Neuromancer was Gibson, I believe. Uh -huh. um, Neuromancer is kind of more pulpy. Um, and not that Snow Crash is not. But uh, Snow Crash is, um, is probably the one that I think most people are familiar with before Ready Player One. That's the most famous. Um, it is a, uh, it's a definitely a dystopian uh, view of things, as they often are. So many of the one L's especially are thinking about outlining right now. Now they have three things to put that off. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <great>. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's, that's, it's really good, actually. So um, I'm going to, uh, because we need to just to qualify this as a law school uh, experience, um, I do want to um, ask at is, least. Is that my whole purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Token. No, I'm just, uh, I'm just joking. Um, it is funny, though, that people who come to a lot of our law tech events, I hear them frequently apologize for being a non-lawyer. And um, we're always like, no, the most interesting people in the room are the non-lawyers. <laughs> Trust me, we're so happy to have you here. Um, so I do want to ask about some of the legal issues that we might be con confronting. I mean, I just men mentioned some of the liability ones that might happen. We might actually have some things happen in a VR space that have a real-world consequence and therefore have a real uh, an existing tort, for instance, right, that might that might happen. But what are some of the other um, issues that keep you uh, awake? And these can be issues, um, I don't think it requires actually a, a lawyer to answer. It, from a company perspective, I mean, you're facing issues too in developing VR and AR technologies and, and from trying to talk to businesses about employing them who are risk averse, right? These issues come up. So what are some of the legal issues that you, that you might see? So from a, from a sort of law school academic perspective, I would say the biggest overarching legal issue is immersion. And it's not a real legal issue, right? It's, it's an issue that overarches every other legal issue and changes the way you have to look at those. So if you think about like personal injury, think of the millions of different personal injuries that could have occurred right here, just in this 10 foot by 10 foot space. And that's not even including interacting with other players, which adds another whole layer of potential personal injury, right? And it's all because you're immersed in this artificial world where if you were in the real world, you'd have a very, you'd have a harder time arguing, I tripped and fell over this wire because I didn't see it. But if you're immersed in this fake world, you trip and fall over that wire, maybe it's because Mike didn't hide the wire well, right? That changes things. So the immersion changes every, every aspect of this. There's, there's, you mentioned women in VR. There's a, um, and not a case because it never went to litigation, um, but there was a story about a woman who was playing a game, um, I think it's a Vive game, it's a, it's a bow and arrow game, basically. And you have an avatar in the game that's an amorphous blob. It's not a, it doesn't have a discernible gendered figure, but you can talk to the other players around you. And one of the other players could hear her speaking and knew that it was a woman playing. So then he, because he is awful, decided to grope her avatar, right? So she, in, in her mind, sees hands coming at her and feels as though she's been groped. This is why we need more women in VR, first of all, because a woman would have thought of that in the development process um, or was more likely to think of that in the development process. Think of the legal issues there, right? There's an assault because assault doesn't require actual physical contact, right? You've all taken your 1L classes. Assault doesn't require an actual physical contact. That's a literal assault. How do we address that? The law is not gonna catch up to that for a long time, but the existing framework of what exists now is gonna be layered on top of the VR world, and we're just gonna pretend that those laws do work. Mm -hmm. um, so in that assault case, the market and you know, the non-lawyers came up with a solution there. The developers went back to the drawing board. They created what they called a power move, where if somebody's bothering you in the game, you do this move, and they're pushed out, and then they disappear from your screen. You can't hear them. They can't hear you. It's like you never interacted with them in the first place. So the developers solved that problem, or at least created a, a, a workaround. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you have the issues of, like, intellectual property. You saw in that, in that 360 video, there were how many trademarks, right? Mm -hmm. Each one of those companies feasibly could come and say, you know, I don't like that our brand is being associated with your brand here, scrub it, or pay us. <clears throat> or they could say, um, on the flip side, hey, you took out our logo in Times Square, but we paid for that space. And that's what you see happening in, in normal traditional advertising now. You know, if I have a stadium and I film something inside of it, I have to figure out what do I do about all these signs all the way around the stadium. So that, it, that framework exists now but the immersion and the new technology just adds a layer on top of it. 
Yeah, and just on the IP note, I mean, there also you could have something that's intellectual property only in a virtual space. In yeah, that and, and so those cases, I think, I don't know that there's much that needs to change there because I think that's been litigated pretty heavily, heavily in all really the Second Life cases. Yes, I think right. that the judges can kind of point to precedent there. Second Life, for those of you who are younger or less nerdy, <laughs> Um, Second Life was like The Sims, but it was online and multiplayer and graphically terrible. But it created like an online virtual chat room where you had real like transactions and people could create things. And it was this whole world that existed outside of the normal world. And people literally sued each other because of copyright infringement in the Second Life universe. I designed shoes in the universe and you copied my shoes in the universe. So. I think those cases will just get kind of adapted a little bit. And I think one, one little point to that, jumping off of that, I think it's, it's telling and it's interesting how our reaction to that is to laugh, right? Because it's, it's funny, but it's only funny because the way in which we're interacting with that world is so arbitrary right now. As this technology matures, we will interact with these worlds the way we interact with the real world. And then it's not funny anymore, right? It's, the sa it's like literally the same thing. If someone comes into my house, and trashes my virtual house. I spent a lot of time and money on that virtual house. Mm -hmm. And it's only funny in 2017. It won't be funny, you know, like, it, it's, it's, it's gonna be a different way for us to wrap our heads around technology. Um, and right now, the only people who care about it are the people that, that we now see are, you know, they're on the fringes because they're spending all day on their computer, but that will not be the case forever. Yeah, and one other point about ownership. So each one of these economies, right, the Second Life economy, <laughs> is all run under a contract that the creators of Second Life have made all their users sign. So over time, as more and more, and this is kind of a dystopian view, right? But if, if you assume that the virtual world is going to be immersive and great, and it costs 1200 or, you know, at, in the future, it costs 200 bucks to get a, an immersive virtual world, why do I need to spend, you know, 1500 bucks on a downtown Raleigh apartment a month, right? Why couldn't you just, or, or more, you know, significantly more, you can spend as much as you want. Um, but in theory, you could spend 300 bucks a month on a basement garbage square, and then go home, plug yourself into something, and pretend you don't live in a 10-foot garbage square, and save a whole lot of money. And that's when people will have to start thinking about these agreements that they're entering into to get into the universe in the first place. Because if their whole life exists there, they're going to value it a lot more than they do now. Yeah. Again, ways that sci-fi helps us to, to imagine these, I think. <laughs> we'll try not to be completely no, it's great, it's great. I will point out that the person who groped in the case that you discussed, or the, um, the issue that you discussed, I, I want to say his avatar name was something like Bad Boy 54 or something like that, so he wasn't even good at it. Yeah. Um, he was, it was, it was, he, there were many, many things wrong with that, with that scenario. Um, and, uh, and really, I love that you talk about um, having a more inclusive development community. Um, back to what Helen said, I, I, I do, it's only one issue, but you didn't mention privacy necessarily, but um, arguably privacy issues um, are a, a major issue. Where you're collecting da data, um, particularly as um, headsets start to get coupled with EEG technology and, and other things and have feedback um, to the person, the privacy issues are heightened. Um, and you know, without having a long discussion around this, but privacy affects different people differently. And we, um, we probably, if we were to take a snapshot of our uh, VR, AR development communities right now, they're not um, adequately represented. That's probably the understatement. And of I, will, the, I just build on to this, that, that um, incident and, and others were, was addressed at the conference by, by the only woman panelists at the conference in that session. She brought it up, and um, what she we we're, in, we're already there, and in, in that one of the reasons she cited um, for the development of technology that puts a distance between you and the, the assault, which assaults are happening on quite alarming rate in virtual worlds now. It's very quite unfortunately common, is that women don't know to take their headsets off. They don't even think about it because they are so immersed that they don't even realize that they're not. Does that make sense? So with virtual reality, we're already at the point where we are in, in interacting with a world that we, our brains don't necessarily know right away, oh, I could just take this off to be safe. Um, so it does bring all these risks to the nth degree and it's higher and... and uh, One quick anecdote, if I can add to that, Helen. I, I, I was in Utah and visited a VR um, entrepreneur who had, instead of working out of his very nice office, he was already a big corporate owner, had all this space to use it. He needed a 10 by 10 space and he rented a budget truck 
and went down by this lake, this real for real, and where all these bugs were swarming around and stuff, and just opened it there. And when I asked him why, he said, because he was so immersed in it. When he came out, he had to immediately breathe a different kind of world and have you know be bitten by flies, you know, all these kinds of things, or else he had trouble coming back. As he said it, and so that really struck me. And, and he was a very savvy user who had like even a kind of intellectual, rational sense about what he was doing, and he knew he had to do something else with his life in order to make that transition well. So I'm not surprised, and it really heightened some of these um, immersion concerns. Is that immersion? Concern. Yeah, and and if you look at like Brown v. EMA, which is the First Amendment in video games case. Um, That's a good one. There, there's a quote in that case that basically says, and and this will this will be the test of that quote. The quote says something along the lines of, well, if you read a good book, you should be immersed in it. So the media doesn't make something immersive, right? Your brain makes it immersive. And this, I don't know. I think maybe this pushes the boundary on that. Maybe this is maybe in this case it is the technology making it immersive. But it'll be interesting to see how the First Amendment comes up in context of Brown v. EMA in the future. So much to talk about, and I want to make sure we save at least 10 minutes for audience questions. So I'm going to ask one more question that has a, a general and a specific part, because it's, and this is a little bit for me, and I'm, I apologize, I'm in, inserting a little bit of myself here. I'm interested in identity issues for various reasons, in the blockchain class that I'm teaching right now, we've got some people that are really focused on, on identity issues. I see the power of a VR space. Um, we've talked about positive and negative things. One thing is that it can maybe de-bias some of our interactions, right? So I could imagine that we're happening in a world we're, we're operating in a world where we are immersed, but we're also not identifying the other person. Uh, Ready Player One, one example. I won't ruin the book, never mind. So, uh, <laughs> but you can imagine that you're interacting with somebody where they don't have the normal indicia of gender, ethnicity, right. age, et cetera, right? So have you, uh, that's the more specific question around de-biasing, but are there other um, powerful kind of social uses that you could imagine for, um, for VR? So narrow or, or general? I have one that I just thought of. So someone has already made, actually a couple of developers have made public speaking uh, simulator apps in VR. And so this is an app where you put on the headset, you look out and you're on a stage in front of 50,000 people and they're all cheering or maybe even more terrifyingly, they're waiting in silence uh, <laughs> and Bush is looking at you. Um, or you could be in a, you know, a small you know, room setting, but you're basically trying to practice your public speaking in VR. Um, you can imagine people training in that way and getting better at doing the real thing. Uh, you can also imagine, um, and this is slightly more insidious, uh, so eye contact is a very big part of, of why we're so effective as social beings. And um, there are a lot of people who struggle with eye contact and struggle with social interaction in general. And it's a long road. And if you're an adult and you still are struggling with those issues, it can feel terrifying and, and you can feel really trapped in social situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you could imagine a virtual avatar where instead of having to really, you know, work on it yourself, you could just purchase a, an eye contact module and, uh, you know, that Mark Zuckerberg will happily sell you. And then suddenly your avatar is making appropriate eye contact and like really looking at people in a way that you, you don't feel comfortable doing. Um, you could imagine having your virtual body be larger, more formidable or in other ways augmented. And so all these things can affect identity, right? How you think of yourself, how you see yourself, how other people see you. And it's gonna get a lot more fluid um, and very strange. <laughs> One of the projects that you, you guys might be interested in, we, we, we ideated a little, a little while back that we were approached by um, an association in the elder law space. They had a cert certification class um, that they wanted um, to try to recruit more elder law attorneys that have to be, have to be knowledgeable in healthcare, will, uh, like across the board issues, so it's, it's a, um, and they were sort of running dry. They were trying to get more interest in the space. And so um, we were ideating a, a, a way of, of putting on a headset and feeling what it feels like to be 85 years old and having paperwork in front of you that you have to fill out. Mm. And Your having, having that, the, sh the, the controllers and their gloves maybe shaking so you couldn't quite, don't know, maybe fogging the glasses somewhat. So you can, you, you can, as an empathy building exercise. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so just to give three sort of short real world examples of things that I know personally, the people working on. Great. One is there's a university in Australia that is working on um, phobia training. Mm -hmm. So basically, they are slowly increasing the amount of spiders in a room, oh. or they're <laughs> or they're putting the you worst on. variable ever, <laughs> <laughs> or they're putting you on top of a, a you know they're putting you on a on a pillar 
and you know, you're afraid of heights, and that pillar at first is five feet high. And by the end of your sensitivity training, that pillar is 500 feet high. Because the idea is that it's a perfectly safe environment where there's literally zero, zero risk, because if you fall off of that pillar, you take two steps to the left, right? You don't actually fall off of a pillar. But your brain, if you're afraid of that, doesn't think of it that way. And so they're doing all these phobia studies and figuring out how they can effectively combat phobias. Um, the second is that the Secret Service is using, it's not, it's 360 video, but it's real-time streamed 3D 360 video. And this is one of the very expensive things that Mike mentioned, um, where the, the Secret Service will send one set of cameras into a stadium, and then they'll have a team of people outside with headsets on. And outside with the headsets, they can look and they can zoom in on a face, and then they can radio into the agents on the inside, hey, this guy looks suspicious, go check out section B13. Right? So that's another one. And then the third one um, is telemedicine. Yeah. So augmented reality and telemedicine. So you can have a combat medic with a, a rudimentary knowledge of surgery who can overlay instructions from a surgeon back in the United States who's saying, hey, that gallbladder is about to rupture. You need to sterilize this right now. Mm -hmm. And that, those are three real world things that I think basically come down to empathy and risk removal. And things like that, of course, with haptics and feedback yeah. become even more powerful. So I, I, I'm going to um, just one quick overlay on that because it's my, my duty to push these social issues. I mean, I think that um, like the stutter or the eye contact or anything that might be a social interference or body size or whatever, as the world in which we operate, uh, virtual worlds become more important to us on whether it's just a time basis or uh, part of our professional belt, whatever it might be. Um, the other part of that, while it's neat that those can happen, they're, of course, oftentimes related to economic ab ability to purchase those, those add-ons or whatever, right? So, um, you know, are we creating a, a, a place where you can, it's almost like genetic modification, right? Um, but it's happening in a, a, a virtual world where those, the haves, have access to it. And, the, and, and that will be an issue, I think, um, that will arrive, the, the socioeconomic fairness. So um, let's hear if anybody has questions for anybody on our panel. Anyone? People are shy today. Did we just blow everyone's mind? <laughs> <laughs> we should take this okay. show on the road. Yeah, is there, I mean, you might be early on in this, but is there data on maybe um, like people engaging in riskier behavior in uh -huh. uh, rea like this world as opposed to virtual reality? Like I was just thinking, you're talking about the phobia of heights. Obviously, phobias are crippling. They interfere with your like day-to-day -day life and that's why you want to fix them but I can also imagine someone who gets really jazzed about going skydiving in virtual reality and then is now an adrenaline junkie and puts themselves in more dangerous situations. Well uh, I mean we've, we've seen a lot of conversation regarding video games um, and, and so I would imagine that you would that would be an, this would be an extension of that and, and how could you argue it will be even more Problematic, or even I don't know. That's my answer to that. But. Yeah, and that was kind of the discussion in Brown v. EMA. Um, and there's also been there are a couple of cases out of I think both were out of Texas actually, just violent kids in Texas. But um, a couple of cases in Texas where kids murdered other kids after playing Mortal Kombat, and yeah. their parents blamed Mortal Kombat instead of their own kids. Um, and the courts basically roundly rejected that theory. Um, but that's courts, right? That's not actual science. That's a court. That's a judge in Texas saying, nope, disagree that has no actual science behind it. I'm not aware of any study. I'm sure someone's working on it. I don't know of any studies. Um, you know, I could see both arguments. One, um, you could see VR as an outlet and a way to get that adrenaline feeling in a safe space um, in a way that the real world is not. Um, but I could also see that being desensitizing and then eventually not being enough. Um, we, our brains are incredibly able to adapt to new situations. And as mind-blowing as VR is, the first time, maybe if it's a part of your life, now you need more and more crazy VR experiences. Yeah, I think to that point, so you think about NASA astronauts, right? NASA astronauts, when they go to a launch a shuttle, they're launching a shuttle for the first time they've ever launched a shuttle, right? Think about that, like the amount of money and power behind them when they go and they hit the button launch, like because they've done it 10,000 times on a simulator, mm -hmm. they know exactly what to do. They've run 10,000 scenarios 10,000 times. They've done it 100,000 times. They've got every variable worked out, but they're only good at it because of the simulator. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, like think about the Columbine kids building their own school shooting app, mm -hmm. right? 
kind of terrifying. So. And, and I used to be the, the one, at, so uh, in the early 90s, during the whole Mortal Kombat, um, you know, fiasco in Congress and Lieberman and all that, um, which eventually led to the creating of the, uh, of the ESRB, mm -hmm. uh, which is an industry accepted, uh, that's basically an industry policing itself. Um, during that whole thing, I well, was... I, oh, oh, just yeah. because I have clients that hate the ESRB, that's <laughs> part of the industry policing every part other part. Part of the industry yeah. policing every other part. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Um, but in general, I, uh, I definitely was uh, someone who was a little bit more skeptical of the video games uh, leading to a correlation and violence uh, argument. And my uh, thinking uh, back then was, you know, what I'm actually doing is sitting on a couch. And what I'm actually doing is holding a controller. And so, yes, it might make societally us all more violent to be watching more violent media or more accepting of it, but I am absolutely, utterly terrified of violent situations in real life, and the fact that I've played countless hours of Call of Duty doesn't change that. But if I imagine a world in which my kids are actually, instead of sitting on a couch with a controller, their version of Call of Duty is putting on the gear, grabbing a controller, beating people to death, like that is a different scenario, right? That's suddenly a lot more real, a lot harder for me to, to mm. kind of wave away. I'll just uh, insert myself here and say that the converse of this whole conversation is when I first started I, trying to find partnerships in, in this area two years ago, I, I met with a gentleman in Wake Forest. Um, he, he's older now, retired, but he keeps, keeps his finger on, on the pulse and had this business for a long time. He was, he was doing this for the military. Um, from the late 80s onwards. Um, and he told me a story, and I won't ever forget. He said um, he, had a he, he had a commander, and I have no idea, he wouldn't tell me any details of what it was, but they had a very high, high profile, high um, difficult action that they had to take with, with a group of, of, of uh, I don't even know the language to use, but mm -hmm. the group of soldiers had to go and do something really risky and he built an EVR world for these guys in the mid 90s, 1990s. This is how long the US military has been using and, and, and like not clunky, like really high power, power. And they rehearsed it and they rehearsed it and they rehearsed it in VR for months. And then the captain came back and, and, and said to my friend, I did not lose a single man in this mission. And I think that it was, I absolutely know it was because of what, what you did. So they were with the machine guns, and they were bludgeoned, and they were doing that. Mm -hmm. So the converse of that is that, that's the converse of it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, was on, I was on a VR panel here in this room at the Sports and Entertainment Law right. Symposium earlier this year. Um, so go to that next year. It's fun. Um, but um, during that panel, I said something to the effect of, I think that we have to be careful how we regulate something that we don't fully understand yet. And so... My suggestion, and this is just my viewpoint, is let the technology get ahead of us, let some bad things happen, and then rein those in, rather than regulating now with no concept of what, yeah. what is actually going to happen. Yeah. yeah, we've definitely had a mix of good and bad that can right. come from mm -hmm. it, and we don't want to squash the good either. Uh, Kyle. Um, so much of American privacy doctrine rests on this concept of reasonable expectations of privacy. Um, this, sort of, this is kind of a two-part question. One part is technical. When you sort of set up a VR system, what what of that information that you're putting into it goes back to the company and becomes business records, things that can be claimed by the government through the current Fourth Amendment um, systems? And then the legal side and something I'd just like to hear you guys speculate on is, does that start to undermine our expectation of privacy within our own space, within our homes, if you are willingly giving out what is in your homes as sort of business records of a company? That's a good question. We're gonna do it. <laughs> so, the, so everybody's looking at me. Um, so I, I will say right off the bat, I'm not a privacy expert. Um, that said, I think that that erosion started 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think people have been giving away their personal information in, in order to get discounted or free access to products mm -hmm. that have virtually no benefit to them for years. Um, I think, you know, you, you read those, you've seen the cases about, you know, Alexa is listening to you right now to wait to hear the wake word Alexa, right? But that 15 seconds of audio is stored on Amazon and deleted every 15 seconds or so. 
but if that 15 seconds changes your life, that's really important, right? Um, so I think we've all sort of decided that we don't have an expectation of privacy anymore. And I don't know, I think most of us that are, that are younger have sort of grown up with that. And what is reasonable has shifted now. And we, right now we're operating under this fiction of my home is sovereign. So worst case scenario, I can lock my door and I am the master of my own home and I just have my family and I'm there. Um, Alexa notwithstanding, um, that technically is still the case. Um, but if you think about how much of our lives we conduct online, then uh, you, you kind of quickly see that your, your physical space being you know, unable or being sovereign really matters very little in terms of people's access to your, to your livelihood and your information. And as we transition our homes to virtual spaces that we identify with, hang out in, maybe even like better than our real homes, um, that virtual space will be run by, you know, stored on some server in Cupertino. So, you know, you're not, it's not going to be your space and everyone's going to be spying on that space. And that's just kind of, unfortunately, the way things are going. It's also not going to be the Facebook Spaces app because it's terrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get one more question in if we can answer. Yeah, so my question about content creation, specifically in, like, individuals who may be don't have a lot of experience but have enough um, technical knowledge to create VR experiences for people and then can kind of release them into marketplaces that I'm sure can pop up or like they use existing marketplaces like Steam for games. Mm -hmm. How, how do we deal with that when um, some of these might be very unsavory, have a lot of things that maybe fall under the First Amendment but are not necessarily things that we want to be in a VR space experiencing, you know, that... Um, that viscerally, um, like you mentioned, the um, Columbine kids creating like a like a shoot up your school app or something like that, or VR experience. How do we deal with that in that kind of space? And will we need to create new regulations around it? Will there have to be real discussions and reformatting of the First Amendment? I mean, I can start it off maybe, but um, from a content. From a content creator's perspective, um, you're right. It's very easy for people who have technical knowledge to start creating content. And there's two fundamental ways in which companies have been approaching this problem. There's the Steam and Valve approach, which is lightly curated, um, but really all they care about is DRM um, and taking their 30% cut. Um, but otherwise, it's the Wild West. You know, you go out there, you if you run into something bad, you should have done your research, versus the Apple approach. Um, which Facebook is also taking, which is very heavy-handed and top-down. Um, Apple still lets a lot more through just because of the size of their platform. It's unmanageable. But Oculus, the titles are so incredibly uh, curated. And I can tell you because we just, we're right now working through a process to try to put something on Oculus Home, and it's a pain in the butt. Um, and that's because they're tightly controlling the experience. And I think both need to exist in a certain sense. And I think there will be the walled gardens if you want to ensure that you're having a good experience. But there will also be the Wild West if you want to saddle up. Um, and, and kind of both will exist. Um, and I, in terms of regulation, I, I don't know how that'll play out. Yeah, so if, if you're really interested in this, I would suggest you fly to Casual Connect in January where I will be presenting on First Amendment and video games. Nice, um, nice, nice plug. That being said, um, that'll only be 20 minutes. So yeah, I, could, I could have a three-hour conversation about that. But in, in general, I would say that this Supreme Court is not in favor of First Amendment regulations, right? Um, I, I, we haven't really seen our new justices Way, our new justice weigh in too much on First Amendment, but I don't think he's going to shift that, really. Um, so I think for the next five years or so, we're probably OK. Um, well, I say we because I represent game developers. Um, <laughs> so they are probably OK. They, they can probably keep counting on this Wild West approach. Um, there, if you haven't read Brown v. EMA, go read it, because it talks about literally kind of the regulation of video games as speech, right? Um, I think the walled gardens, that is probably the market-based solution that we, that we need. You think about just any other technology, like the internet or DVDs, right? Blockbuster didn't carry a lot of adult films, right? Independent video stores did. They did it in the back room. So the, the market kind of segregated that stuff on its own. Um, the, the internet is another example, but Google 
um, rarely takes things off of Google unless mm -hmm. they're specifically complained about. So, um, yeah, so I think there's, there's a spectrum there. I will yeah. say I had um, very interesting conversations with, um, with Upload VR in, 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 in the, on the West Coast. They have uh, their own internal problems. About, uh, they, I, I know it. <laughs> uh, so this is a very interesting thing to say because I think there's, and you go to one of their conferences and they have what some, some may, may think is on the cusp of unsavory you know, pieces there, along with all sorts of other things. But there is discussion in the industry in the, among people doing VC financing for companies in, who are a part of um, you know, incubators that they, they, they want to see certain criteria. They actually, you're, you're more likely to get funding if you're a B corporation as opposed to an LLC, for example. Um, so that's something to think about as you as you work with startup companies in this area. That that th this is a this is a conversation that's being had, and I think it's very valuable. I, I wish they would talk about it more, and I wish they would live it more. Um, but it, it's good to, to to think and talk about it. Does Does everybody know what a B corporation is? Okay, so so a B corporation is not actually a legal entity structure. A B corporation is a nonprofit. Uh, the, the, there's a certifying group that's a nonprofit that says, "Hey, you're a certified B corp," which means you do some public. No, good. no, no. Uh, mm, I work for B Lab. There's B Corp, which is which is um, a nonprofit type structure. But then there is the actual B corporation structure. In some only states. in some states, in not some in states, North Carolina, yeah. not, not here. North Carolina yeah, yeah. Sorry, yet. Yes, fair but enough. in some states, it is a is a legal. Um, yeah. So a B corporation basically is a for-profit corporation that does a public benefit in making a profit. Yeah. That's actually a really interesting point. We have a se several classes here at the law school that will talk about choice of entities, particularly for social enterprises. So you'll learn, you can learn more about that. Um, <laughs> it, to add to three endorsements, um, brand speech, speaking engagements elsewhere, um, the Entertainment Law Society, and also rallies, I will add three thanks. I want to thank our um, uh, organizers, the Law and Technology Society. Thank you so much for your good questions, and most of all, thank you to our panel. So I really Please appreciate it. Please come down and have a yes. photo. Uh, anybody wants uh, a VR?